Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to this UK data service webinar giving an introduction to 2021 census geography data sets. The presenter today will be James Crone of the UK data service based at Adena at the University of Edinburgh. Thanks, Jill. Um, welcome to this webinar, everyone. In this webinar, we're going to talk an introduction to 2021 census geography data sets. The first couple of slides, are, we're going to look at the census itself, just to give some background. The UK census is an opportunity to ask the entire country questions about the population. Um, within the UK, it runs every 10 years. It was last held in 20, 2000, uh, 2021 in England and Wales. Um, because of COVID in Scotland, it was actually held this year in 2022. And what the sort of questions you ask are directed at both households and individuals. So the household questions may be about the actual property that people are living in. Individual questions will be more about um, the sex of the individuals, their ages, and where they sort of work, sort of job they do. The census in the UK is um, carried out differently in the different nations because of the different UK national statistics agencies. So in England and Wales, it's run by the Office for National Statistics. In Scotland, it's run by GROS. Sorry, Register of Scotland. Uh, yeah. And in Northern Ireland, it's run by NISRA. In the old days, the census form was always filled in by paper. And you would get it on census day. You would fill it in and post it away. In recent years, they moved to doing it online. So you can now do your submission online. So, as I say, in England and Wales, the census was done in 2021. And so, over the last year or so, ONS have been processing all that census data that's been submitted from the forms and building output data. And what they produce from this uh, data is univariate and multivariate tables of census statistics. Um, so, univariate data would be a single amount of data about uh, the people, and multivariate would allow you to explore the relationship between the different types of census data. Once all that data has been processed, uh, the census statistics are output as tables with counts of people or counts of households. And the data is output at different levels of small area output geography, the smallest of which is the census output area. And so what you can see here is a map showing parts of Edinburgh, and we're showing some a few census output areas. And we have a table here showing univariate statistics. So the idea, each of these output areas is a small area of geography to which you could have associated with it different census statistics. Now, output areas are a synthetic geography that are created purely for the publication of census statistics. And we can get a bit of information about uh, output areas. The output areas, because they're synthetic, are built using a zone building system in terms of the relationship being how many people within or households are within each output area, you have a minimum of 40 households and 100 residents, up to a maximum of 250 households and 625 residents. When they're building the output areas, there's a design goal to make sure that the population within the output area is homogenous. So that across the output area, you're having, uh, you're comparing like for like in terms of the population. And a secondary goal is to ensure that is to minimize the amount of change between the 2021 output areas and the 2011 output areas. So again, so it's easier to make changes and you're not comparing boundaries that are massively different between 2021 and 2011. And you can see the output areas cover a relatively small area. So they typically form like a street or a, a few streets together in terms of buildings. Within the last between the 2011 census and the 2021 census, there's also been changes to the population. So there's been a gradual increase in population size across the country as a whole, and, um, and changes in population density and the distribution of the population. As for example, power blocks have been demolished or new houses have been built. And also within the output areas themselves, there could be changes to the homogeneity of the population as there's been local changes. And to account for this, and to make sure the output areas maintain their design criteria in terms of those numbers of households and residents and the homogeneity, 
they have to make minor adjustments to the help areas between 2011 and 2021. So across England and Wales as a whole, they believe the, the, it's believed that 95% of 2011 help areas have remained consistent into 2021. And within that 5%, there's been different sort of change. So some of the 2011 help areas have merged to 2021 help areas. And then some of the 2011 help areas have split into two or more help areas. And you can see that this is just showing leads, for example. And in blue, you can see the 2011 help areas that have merged into, that have basically been merged together to create a single 2021 help area. And the orange are showing when where that 2011 help area has split into two or more parts to form two or more separate 2021 help areas. So the splitting might have happened where the population density has massively increased. So the help areas now, now no longer are now too large in terms of population for an help area. So they have to be divided into, separate, into small areas, into separate help areas. Whereas emerging is they could have been a population decrease and in order to maintain the minimum level of population, they've had to be joined together. And you can see a more detailed example of this if you look into one of those help areas in Leeds. So this shows for the same locale of Leeds um, the help area boundaries in 2011 and 2021. So at left, you have the 2021, you have the 2021 boundaries, and at right, you have the 2020. You have, sorry, at left, you have the 2011 boundaries. At right, you have the 2021 boundaries. And you can see in the 2011, you had a single help area which covered the entire locale. Whereas in 2021, that single output area is split into three 2021 output areas. And the reason that's happened is because between 2011 and 2021, an area from a brownfield site has um, they built a housing estate on it with new population. So the, the population within that area has massively increased. So they've had to split the output area into two parts. And also in 2021, they decided to, um, at the top, there, there's a tower block here which is a, a quite a dense population and has a different population characteristics to, I guess, the terrace housing. So they decided to create an output area just for the tower block itself. So you've gone from one to three. And you can imagine this happening right across the city in those areas of change, where there's been changes to the, the different types of population and, and this, so they've adjusted the output areas. But by themselves, they don't purely use output areas. Um, because of this thing called statistical disclosure control, which is there to ensure that from census aggregate data, you can't identify individuals. And there's a risk you could do that from help areas because they do cover quite small populations. And you could have like only one sort of type of person who has a particular employment within the help area, so they could be identified as an individual. And so because of that, for some of the certain census statistics, they need to, need to output those at a lot, much larger areas. To, to do this, as well as the output areas, they have a thing called super output areas, which are much larger um, amalgamations of output areas. And there are two layers of those. There's a lower layer, super output area layer, and there's a middle layer, super output area layer. We've got some numbers here. So you can see they're all, they, they cover a much larger number of people and much larger number of households. So the lower layer, it's up to 3,000 people. The middle layer, up to 15,000 people. And again, 1,200 households for the lower layer, 6,000 households for the middle layer. And how these are created are by merging output areas together to create lower super output areas, and then lower super output areas to create middle super output areas, which you can see on the right here. So we have a single output area, this would merge with five other output areas to create a single LSOA. In turn, those five LSOAs could form an MSOA, as here. And the important thing is that OAs, LSOAs, and MSOAs all nest within local authorities, and they all nest within each other. So, and that's a perfect um, alignment. There's some minor terminology different between England and Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. So in England and Wales, you have output areas, LSOs, MSOs. 
in Scotland, you develop areas. And in 2011, you had a thing called data zones and intermediate geographies. Uh, in Scotland, the data zones are equivalent to LSOAs, and the intermediate geographies are equivalent to MSOAs. In Northern Ireland, the lowest geographies are called the small areas, which are the equivalent of the output areas. And in 2021, they're going to produce super output areas for Northern Ireland, but just a single layer. They're, I guess the equivalent of the LSOAs. Again, the Scotland census only happened this year, so the the, the geographies for Scotland won't probably appear until next year when they start to produce the actual census stats for Scotland. So as well as producing the census stats for the statistical areas, which they call statistical building blocks, the output areas, the LSOs and the middle SOAs, it weighs. Census stats can also be output for the different non-census geographies to enable the census data to be compared with other data, which may only be published at those geographies. So you, you could um, you can produce census stats by local authority, or by electoral ward, or parliamentary constituency. If you want to look at um, electoral results and within the context of census data, or health outcomes, depending on particular policy types. Um, the, 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 uh, this um, webinar is really an introduction to geospatial. Uh, sorry, is, is census geography data, which is the realm of geospatial data. So there's like four sort of fundamental um, types of uh, principles of geospatial data. So there's vector and raster data. So vector data consists of point lines and polygons. What makes uh, geospatial data geospatial is it's a reference to a spatial reference system. In our case, the British National Grid, which just locates um, those polygons or those lines in geographic space. If everything's in the same spatial reference system, then you can tie different data sets together. L lastly, each each of the census output geography instances has an alphanumeric code called a geographic identifier, which uniquely identifies that particular instance. Um, so you can say that this particular output area is for this is, is here, and this one in a different part of the world or the UK rather is, is different to that one, and it allows you to tie data to that output area. And then a geographic lookup table is a means of, a, of relating one type of geography to another. And in terms of these geographic identifiers, I, I, say, I said these are these alphanumeric digits. So that you can see one here. And this in the UK, for UK census data, uses the GSS coding system, which is the government statistical service system of codes. Um, if you're familiar with earlier census data, from 20, 2001 and before, these tend to use hierarch, 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 hierarchical codes. So you might have quite a long digit, which of say eight eight digits, and embedded within those um, codes was the was the code of the county, the district, or the ward, which say the output area nested within. And you could use the code purely in itself to work out the hierarchy of that output area. This is not the case with GSS codes. They purely contain the type of geography and the unique ID of that instance, which you can see here, for example. So all the codes are nine digits in length, and the first three digits are the entity, which is the type of geography, and the remaining digits are the unique ID of the instance within that geography. So for example, you can see we have an E00 one, two, six, six, seven, nine code. The entity code is the first three digits, which is E00. And the remaining digits are the unique ID of that instance. And the ONS produces a thing called the Registry of Geographic Codes, which you can look up and it will tell you what each of those three digit entities actually means in terms of what geography it relates to. So we take our E00126679 as our E00 entity, I mean, look it up in the registry, you can see that, that refers to output areas. Whereas if we take the E07 000118, E07, you can tell that refers to non metropolitan districts. The GSS codes, geographic identifiers, allows us to uniquely identify instances of geography. So, in terms of census boundary data sets, as I said, they're a type of geospatial data. 
and they describe the spatial footprint of an instance of a given geography and consist of one or more polygons. And each of those polygons is made up from points. Nothing too hard about that. Um, because they're geospatial data, they will be provided in GIS, GIS data formats, like shape files, which you might use in every, a desktop GIS software like ArcGIS or QGIS. Or you, in these days when people use R and Python, you might ingest it into a data frame or something. Um, but shape files are still fairly ubiquitous. They're like the CSV of the geospatial world. And you get different flavors of the boundaries. So the, the ONS in particular produce their um, census output geography boundaries in an extent of the realm variant. And I clipped the mean high water mark variant. So what we have here is a map showing some boundaries at the extent of the realm. So the extent of the realm which it, it, the, the realm is the UK and the extent is how far that it, it is the extension into the sea, basically. So it's like the territorial waters almost. And you can see how that, what that looks like in terms of boundaries. If you look at, if you're familiar with the Bristol geography, there's these two small islands here. And then the extent of the realm flavor, there's this, you can see it extends away from the land into the sea and creates this like bizarre feature, which is, it's not very aesthetically pleasing, but it is correct in terms of the actual the geography. Whereas a clipped variant provides a much more familiar geography. And it, it, it mean high water. So in the mean high water variant, you get to see all the, the river extents. You get a much more aesthetically and familiar geography in terms of the coastline. So if you the the general recommendation is that you use the mean high water version if you're producing um, visualizations or maps, because your your viewers of your maps will be get a much more familiar geography. Um, but because it shows the rivers in quite great detail, if you are like doing some sort of analysis of data inland, and so you might be looking at, you might have point data which you might be trying to relate to the polygons. But because the extent of the the, the clipped version includes the, the river areas, you may find up your point falls inside the river rather than the actual polygon. So the 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 advice is to use the extent of the realm versions if you're doing any sort of analysis, which could be spatial analysis. So you're comparing one geography to another. And so that's the difference between the extent of the realm and the clipped variant. They're normally just called clipped rather than clipped to mean high water. And then there's also beyond these extent of the realm and mean high water, is a thing called generalization. And generalization is the process of taking what could be a very complicated geography, sorry, polygon, with thousands of points and stripping out some of those points so that the, the feature is made up of less points, but still retains the look of the, the polygon. And that's to make simply to cut down the file size, uh, which makes exchanging the data quicker. But it also means if you're using the boundaries of N like a GIS, it's quicker for the, the system to draw the polygons. So it makes the data a lot more um, responsive if you're creating a map from it or if you're using it in a web application or something. And there, there are various different, um, the, the ONS, for example, produce free, uh, two or three types of generalization, the super generalized, which are very small file sizes, but the geometry could be quite um, distorted. And again, the, the 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 advice is to use generalized bound boundaries for visualization purposes, where you want to like cut down the file size and still are quite responsive maps, but to use the ungeneralized data for when you're doing any sort of spatial analysis, because you want to make sure that the you're not um, creating problems when you're trying to compare other data sets. You want the data to be as accurate as possible when you're doing analysis. So those are polygons, and then there's another thing called so centroids. Um, a centroid is literally just a point. So it's a simplification of the census geography from a polygon to a point. There are two types of um, centroid. There's geometrically weighted and there's population weighted. The geometrically weighted one simply takes is a spatial average of all the points that make up the polygon. And it could be a center of mass, for example, whereas the population weighted the point is based on some the underlying population. And these two could be different positions. 
because census data is based on populations, population weighted centroids are the norm. And you could use centroids for simple analysis, like, so if you want to find the distance from a road to some, some output areas, it'd be quicker just to use them as the, the output area uh, centroid points, because then you could relatively quickly compute the distance between the road and those points, rather than having to like consider the entire set of coordinates to make up the polygon. But mostly, centroids are used for georeferencing purposes, where you might want to relate boundary one to boundary two, and you might find that boundary one does not nest perfectly within boundary two. So rather than doing a consideration of the full geometry of the polygons in one versus two, you could um, just use the, the centroids of point of the geometry one and then do an overlay against the second one, which would be non-exact, but it would allow you to make some sort of lookup in order to map one geography to another. And then sensors lookup tables. So in a lookup table, you have some input value, which you then look up and then output uh, an output value. So for example, here are some examples. Could we, we could have a 2021 output area, and then we'll have a lookup table that maps to the 2021 LSOA, the 2021 MSO, and the 2022 LAD. So we will look up from output area to LSOA to MSOA to LAD, which is our standard census output geographies. Or we could have a 2021 output area, and we could have a look up to care boards or NHS regions. Or more usefully, we could have a look up from 2011 output areas to 2021 output areas, which will at least allow us to do some sort of um, comparing 2011 data to 2021 data. And then postcode directories, which are produced by the ONS, at ONS and are also available for the UK data service, are a special type of lookup table for postcodes because postcodes are, are quite regularly used in other types of survey or a lot of data is georeferenced by postcode. So it's useful to find out what geographies, census geographies they relate to. So you can then add context to your postcode data. So you, you could have a postcode, which could be produced for this year or this month forever, and a mapping to output areas, LSOAs and countries. And this is just an example of a geographic lookup table. And again, you can see it's got these nine digit geographic identifiers. So we have the nine digit geographic identifiers for output areas, which have a lookup to nine digit geographic identifiers for LSOAs, which map to nine di digit geographic identifiers for MSOAs, which in turn map to nine digit geographic identifiers for local authority districts. Lookup tables, just a way of mapping different types of geography. So in terms of plans for the release of 2021 census geography data sets, so that's boundaries, centroids, and lookup tables through the UK data service. So currently, the UK data service provides access to our database of boundaries, which goes back to 1971. So we have 1971, 81, 91, 2011, and we are in the process of adding the 2021 boundaries. So the boundary data selector allows you to make sub-selections from our database and then to choose the type of output format you want the data in. So for example, you could just select all the output areas for a suburb of London and extract that as a shape file or as a map info file. Easy download just provides pre-canned data. You don't, it doesn't allow you to make sub-selections. You can simply download all the boundaries all the output areas, say for England, for Wales, or for Scotland, in as a, a shape file or a tab file or whatever. And through the easy download, we also provide access to the centroids and the lookup tables. Postcode data selector is a bit like boundary data selector, but for postcodes, it allows you to make sub selection from so postcode directories. So you can select all the postcodes within the Nottingham NG9 postcode district and it will allow you to pick which um, types of geography to look up to. So as I said, the my team, so myself and my other colleagues in Adina are in the process of adding new census geography data sets to the UK data service applications. 
So we take the data from ONS at the minute because ONS have released them since about August and they're still releasing the boundaries as they go. We're also some of generating some of the higher geographies from the output areas. And we'll add these to the applications in the next few months or so. Um, we have to do some minor updates to the applications and also to the interfaces because to support the new 2021 data. And because when you use our UK data service applications, um, there's a pop-up questionnaire which asks you to provide feedback on the applications. Over the past year or so, we've had quite a lot of feedback that people can't tell what sort of data what, what the data set is like they're downloading before they download it. So we're going to try and add some sort of preview functionality to the boundary data selector, which will allow you to like see uh, some sort of visualization of the boundaries before you download them and the sort of attributes they have. So you can check whether the boundary is compatible with the data that you want to try and join to it. And we're going to, also going to try and add some additional geospatial data formats like GeoPackage, which is becoming more popular as an alternative to shapefiles. So this should be happening in the next few months or so. So the latter part of the webinar, having covered the, the data itself, is just to provide some examples of how you could use the boundaries and sort of for visualization purposes of census data. So people are probably quite familiar of using boundaries for visualizing census data. But the idea is you have some sort of aggregate statistics, which here is by Scottish council areas. Here we have um, the number of males and we have um, the, so the total number of males per Scottish council area and the number of males who are employed in manufacturing. And we've just basically cut a, a, a proportion on the, the third column that just tells you the proportion of males within each council area who are employed in manufacturing. And then we have a set of boundaries for the same geography as the stats. So these are Scottish council areas. And the idea is you join your attributes to your boundaries using the common geographic identifier. And when you do that, each boundary then has that stat. So we can tell that Edinburgh here, we have about 5.27% of persons are employed in manufacturing who are male. Whereas out in Fife, it's 15.55. And likewise, in East Lothian, it's 8.47. So, I mean, it's not very, you can't really, this requires you to actually read the values, which is how you, how you have this type of map called a chloropleth map. And all you do in a chloropleth map is you shade the polygons according to the actual statistic that is attached to that polygon. So we can hear a chloropleth map here. Uh, this is showing all the UK. Um, so darker areas are basically higher percentages of this particular census stat which in this case is a percentage of people employed in agricultural, forestry, and fishery. So in this case, as per perhaps not surprisingly, the higher proportions are in rural areas. So particularly the Scottish borders and the middle of Wales, and there's clearly less people employed in agricultural, forestry, and fishery than the central belt of Scotland and southern England. Chlorophyll maps are a, which you use based on boundaries, provide an easy way to visualize how a measurement varies across a geographic area or to show variability within a region. So that's, and because of the, as I said, the census data is output of different geographies of which you have different types of boundaries, you may be able to put, map the same census variable at different levels of geography as here. So on the left, we have the census statistic mapped at a local authority level. Whereas on the right, we have that same variable mapped at an output area level. Um, so at the higher level, you tend to get um, quite smooth. The, the data is smoothed and you get like general sort of trends. Whereas the more detailed level, you can obviously see more detail in that, how, the sort of local nuances in the data. But again, because it's like the, the polygons are more are smaller, you tend to get some sort of noise. So it's, it, it may be less um, interpretable at this level if you were sticking in a random report or something. And also because earlier we said there was this issue of disclosure control, you may find that not all your variable is available to be mapped at both levels. So it just depends on the variable in question. Now, there are some problems with chloroplefs that people should be, you should be aware of. 
and one of which is the chlorophyll map, it tends to imply that the population is distributed uniformly, uniformly across the polygon. Again, if we go back to our area of leads, and we have our, and we've got the bound region shown in red, but you can see, if you look at an aerial photograph underneath, that there are large areas of this polygon where there's no actual people living. So for example, there's an area of Greenland here, as a churchyard of a graveyard here. It, it, you couldn't say that the population is uniformly distributed across that polygon. And there's also another problem. We don't have enough time to go into detail here, but there's a thing called the modified aerial unit problem, um, which is a, affects census boundaries, and especially if you're looking at change over time, because you may not be comparing like for like if your polygons in 2021 are different to your polygons in 2011. And if, you're, if you've got two maps side by side showing boundaries of 2011 and 2021, because of the changes in the actual polygon geometry, you're not comparing like for like. So that's something to be aware of. To, to get around the first issue, what we've seen in sort of like the last 10 or so years is, is um, especially in a site called Datashine, is a thing on, is, is to take those chlorophyll maps and try and mask them using like another type of data, another polygonal data set. Um, so sort of buildings, for example, and these are like mass chlorophyll maps. Uh, in some ways that does away with the, the, the tendency for chlorophyll to depict the population as being consistent across the entire zone. Because here then the data is only output where there are buildings. So in some ways it provides a more um, realistic depiction of the population structure. So, I mean, if you're not already seeing it, the Datashine website is really great. There's the Datashine Scotland and there's Datashine England and Wales. These are both obviously produced for 2011 data. So the expectation is they will presumably be produced for 2021 data in England and Wales or 2022 data for Scottish data. Another form of visualization that you can produce from boundaries are cartograms. So a cartogram is like instead of um, instead of drawing the polygon areas based purely on the land area, you draw the polygon based on the actual variable you're mapping. So you, you distort the geography based on like say the percentage of people employed in manufacturing. A polygon that has a large amount of manufacturing will be started distorted and will be relatively larger than a polygon with a small percentage of manufacturing, producing a, cart a different type of visualization. And there are various types of cartogram, so non-contiguous, contiguous or drawing cartograms. And the big advantage of cartograms is they help, like they they help when you have like large populations mapped to very small areas. I mean, as in here, for example. So this is a map showing um, um which is like uh, this is people in it who actually are in a mortgage property, so they own their home essentially. And it dates across Scotland, but within the central belt, because the areas of Glasgow and Edinburgh are so small, they're quite hard to see versus the large ruler areas in a chlorophyll map. Whereas if you map that same variable using a cartogram, then those small urban areas are a lot more prominent, and it's a lot easier in some ways to see the the the, the pattern, the variability in the data using a cartogram. Um, cartograms have been used for census data quite widely. So there's an excellent book that was published for the 2011 data called People and Places, and it's full of these cartograms. Um, it's a really excellent book. It just takes all the various census topics for 2011 and then basically uses cartograms to, to show them. Um, you can also, if you, if you wanted to, you could create these sort of cartograms using a desktop GIS like QGIS. Which has plugins to do these sort of stuff. We're sort of coming to the end of the webinar in terms of the formal talking. There are sort of three bits of information, sort of resources you might want to look at if you, to get more information. So Professor David Martin and his team at Southampton were responsible for building the AZ tool, which is the piece of software that, that the was used to to create the output areas themselves. And, and David Martin and his team have produced. Um, some great resources describing that tool. And also David has, has into the, the history of the census. So David's blog post, which is on the UK Data Service Data Impact, 
um, website is a really great place to look for the history of the census, sorry, the history of the geography of the census in the UK. Um, the AZ tool um, page from the Southampton folks is great for if you want to get more into the details of how open areas are built and the whole thing of automated zone design. And then ONS, I've made, I've got this excellent set of resource called the ONS Geography and Statistics Training Course, which provides some great um, tutorials about how you could like, how to analyze data and use geography, both in a desktop GIS, but also programmatically using um, R and Python. So that's something you, you might want to look at if you want to go down that route.